sent here to learn how we camouflage this field. Is that it? That's right, sir. Yes, sir. I understand this is one of the best camouflage air drones in existence. If it deceives the enemy, it is. I see you've had some camouflage training. Some, yes. Never on a scale as large as this, sir. Lieutenant, the size of the job may vary, but the principles of camouflage don't. May I smoke, sir? Go ahead. And by the way, gentlemen, I don't believe we will. No, thanks. I want you to bear in mind the two basic objectives of all camouflage. Conceal and deceive. Conceal personnel and materiel and deceive the enemy as to their location, identity, and extent. If you remember that, it's in the bag. Yes. Yes, now let's just take a look at this airdrome before we begin our job. You'll notice that the runways and the buildings stand out like a fistful of sore thumbs. That's because the runways are smooth in texture. Smooth surfaces reflect light, whereas rough surfaces absorb it and appear dark from the air. Problem number one, then, was to do something about the runway. The smooth surface of cement would make it stand out from the air no matter how we colored it. Thus, our first job was to texture it in order to make it look dark. First, we applied a coating of tar. Then we covered it with crushed stone, and we sprayed it with paint so that from the air it blended in perfectly with the turf on either side. But the runways were only part of the job. A large open field is suspicious in itself, and our second problem here was to make the entire field blend into the surrounding territory. Wherever clumps of trees or hedges protruded onto the field, we continued them in a natural, uneven line by means of a matching shade of paint. This is what we call a simulated hedgerow. We completed the deception by means of directional mowing. That is, on one side, we mowed the grass at right angles to the simulated hedgerow. On the other, we mowed it parallel to it. Now, from the air, this gives the appearance of two separate fields. Earth scars, which would reveal recent activity, were sprayed so that from the air they'd look like bushes or trees. And it's surprising how genuine they look from the air. But even from the air, Major, do you mean those painted hedgerows would actually fool a bombardier? They don't have to fool him for long. Remember that a bombardier has only about 30 seconds in which to sight his target and release his eggs. And if our camouflage can fool him for 30 seconds, we've done our job. That's right, sir. All right, sir, granting that. But how about things like buildings? And, uh... I was coming to that. Now, suppose we take a look at this transparency. This was shot from the air before the field was camouflaged. Now, you brought up the question of buildings. Notice that the regular shadows cast by the buildings were easily seen from the air. Now, this meant that we either had to let the enemy see them, but disguise them so that they wouldn't look like military installations, or we had to camouflage them and distort the shadows so that the enemy wouldn't see them at all. I see. We used both methods. Some of the buildings we chopped up with paint so that they looked like lawns and small suburban houses. Others, which were not situated to make such a treatment possible, we concealed entirely. Our first move was to paint deceptive shadows on the ground and corner walls. We used old crankcase oil for this, then we nailed green steel wool to the walls and spread it out on the ground to make it resemble a lawn. And painted strips up the sides of the building to match. We textured the roofs the way we textured the runway. But instead of crushed stone, we used wood chips on a base of sticky tar, spraying them with paint to match the surrounding terrain. The 
green painted wall blended nicely into the steel wool, which we cut in an irregular pattern that grass or shrubbery might take. Thus, from the air, the building and the ground looked the same. Incidentally, this steel wool is one of the most useful props a camouflage officer has. Literally, it covers a multitude of sins. Besides being used when we want to simulate grass, we use it for drapes, flat tops, and sometimes for even covering airplane wheel tracks. What's this stuff? Looks like chicken feathers to me. It is made of chicken feathers. <laughs> it's a mighty good texturing agent when we want to do away with any smooth, reflective surfaces. It can be painted any color to match almost any background you want. But I'd say this is the most widely used of all artificial agents. That's Osnaburg, isn't it? That's right. Osnaburg? O-S-N-A-B-U-R-G. Here's some of different colors and not on the net. Well, we use it most frequently to conceal airplanes and guns. It breaks up the regular lines and shadows. However, hey, honey, I'm older than you are. However, more important than the concealing airplanes on the field is dispersing them so that no group of them can ever become the target of one single bomb. And now just let me give you a little tip. Take advantage of the natural terrain, of the protection nature might afford. Here we placed some of our planes under the protection of woods, parking them along the edge. We placed others over some of these simulated hedgerows so that the shadow of the plane blended into the paint. And remember, if you're ever called on to do this, place the wing axis of the plane parallel with either the natural or the simulated terrain features. We park some of our planes in revetments and dispersal pens to protect them if the field were bombed. But revetments are excellent targets unless they're camouflaged. Now you want to remember that. Here, for natural concealment, we located our revetment in the sides of hills and for the most part, use the natural camouflage of green grass, shrubs, and tall trees. Over the top of the revetment, we spread a more or less permanent Osnaburg flat top. I know that you're going to say that none of this looks particularly effective from the ground. But we're not doing this for the people on the ground, but rather for the aerial photographers and bombardiers. And what to you men may look like a blob of paint may appear to be a very deceiving shadow when viewed from an airplane. Cigarettes, sir? I don't believe I will. Now right. hand me those transparencies. Now here, as I showed you before, these runways stand out plain as day. These airplanes haven't been properly dispersed, and see how plainly you can see them from the air? Now let me show you this one. From the same aerodrome, after we did our camouflage. See how our texturing, our directional mowing, and our simulated hedgerows have blended the runways in with the rest of the landscape. Here, what appears to be a clump of woods is simply ground painting and false shadows on our buildings. Now, here's the photograph without camouflaging. See how these planes stand out? Now have a look at this one. See if you can spot any. All right, here's one, and here, and here's another. Pretty hard to find, aren't they? Well, if you can't find them, what luck do you think a bombardier would have? Oh, well, Major, a little more time. Oh, but now you're talking in terms of something that a bombardier hasn't got. All right, now I want to try on this one. Come on, Lieutenant. Here are two parallel roads. And here's an ammunition dump. Now, this road, ending abruptly as it does, is a dead giveaway. Now, how would you handle it? Well, uh, Major, you could camouflage the dump and continue this road on up here to this road. <laughs> well, I'll give you 50% on that. But remember, conceal and deceive. Now, with your idea, we only conceal the ammunition dump. And that's only half the job. How about deceiving Jerry a bit? How? Well, simple. We build another road from here to here and spoil the natural appearance of the woods. Jerry knows that somewhere in this vicinity there's an ammunition dump. Well, we camouflage it. 
then to prevent him from studying the terrain too closely, to give him something to shoot at, we build a decoy. A decoy? Yes, and that's just exactly what we did with our airdrome. Now let's take another look at our photograph. And now you'll remember this is our camouflage field, and this is our decoy. But the decoy's camouflaged too. Yes, but you'll notice that we purposely haven't made a very good job of it. That in itself is a technique. We've camouflaged it just enough to show our enemy that we've tried to hide it. But we also left just enough of our installations visible to attract his fire. For instance, we used every break that nature had given us. One of the fields in our decoy was thick with goldenrod. We took advantage of this and placed several decoy airplanes around. We camouflaged them for green brush and grass on the hunch that the enemy might believe that the goldenrod grew on what was otherwise a well-camouflaged airdrome. We used several types of decoy planes, some very complete, Others just simple jobs made of canvas and held together by wire and a few sticks. They can be made at almost any air base and require very little material and work. The real trick is in staking them out, because if the fabric is not stretched tight and irregular shadows result, you defeat your own purpose. Remember, the regular shadows cast by airplanes are the bombardier's chief means of spotting them from the air. We pulled another little stunt here, you might remember. By driving a jeep over the goldenrod, while the ground was still a little soft, we made a series of tracks that the enemy might think were made by airplane. We added another touch of realism by making some dummy machine guns, which we were careful to only partially conceal. Such guns can easily be made from a few rough logs. While they don't cost much, they're a help in drawing Jerry's fire from the real airdrome. We park some of the decoy ships on the edge of a wood. Good practice in concealing real airplanes. But here we purposely park them just a little too far out and drape them with an Osnaberg netting that was not only poor, but slightly off color. As a little added ballyhoo, we finished off the dummy propeller with aluminum and white paint and made sure that it shone through in the sun. At another point on our decoy, we built an excellent flat top over a road. Nothing phony about that job. Made of steel wool, it's well constructed. But we placed it so that it caused an otherwise normal road to end abruptly which is one sure way of arousing the enemy's suspicions. Now near this abrupt end, we put up our decoy buildings with just enough normal activity around them to make them look like the real thing. We built the decoy buildings of wood and cloth and painted in the windows. Thus, maintenance, in spite of a few playful soldiers, is merely a matter of adhesive tape and paint. Now you'll notice in preparing our decoy, I stress the importance on building roads and breaking in paths that might be spotted from the air. But I can't remind you too forcefully that in camouflaging our real airdrome, it's just the reverse. As a matter of fact, you rascal. Goodbye. As a matter of fact, you'll notice that these orders on camouflage discipline emphasize this point in the very first paragraph. All personnel will keep to marked paths and only in cases of real emergency will designated boundaries of paths be crossed. Very often in moving from area to area, you'll find that your personnel will forget that flat tops and established paths are there for their own protection. On camouflage, a straight line might still be the shortest distance between two points, but it isn't the safest. 
If we're going to deceive the enemy successfully, the natural appearance of the terrain must be preserved. For that reason, we tape both sides of our established path. But despite the tape, we still find our personnel occasionally taking a shortcut. Now that's all right for snipers and machine gunners, for example, who understandably can't have paths leading directly to their positions. But these men are taught how to take new routes each time so they don't break in new paths that might possibly be visible from the air. I want to point out that the tracks of personnel aren't the only things you'll have to watch either. Airplanes, particularly the big bombers and transports, frequently leave big gouges and tracks when they land on grassy fields. Such tracks are invitations to the enemy. We eliminate them by filling them with wood chips for texture and then spraying the chips with paint to match the grass and turf. We use wood chips here because they're plentiful. But chicken feathers or ground up stone will do just as well. You've certainly done a complete job, sir. Well, that's what we thought until a few weeks ago. And they sent us a detachment of new troops and we had another problem. What's that, sir? Teaching them camouflage discipline? That was only part of it. Our big problem was to conceal 180 tents. How would you have done that, Lieutenant? How about Osnaberg? There ain't that much Osnaberg, Lieutenant. You got something there. So we had to find a simpler solution. Our first precaution was to avoid all regular alignment, and wherever possible, to keep the tents under the cover of trees. Then we treated them with an olive drab compound in order to blend them into the surrounding terrain. The men themselves presented our chief difficulty. Despite a thousand warnings, we still found them swinging away with their machetes as though they were in deepest Africa. The natural appearance of the landscape had to be maintained, and to keep them from cutting away the underbrush was a career. Night blackouts were another headache. We found that ordering all lights out at night wasn't practical. So we set to work and designed a shield that would permit just enough light to get by on. After a lot of tries, we finally settled on this one. It can be made of steel, asbestos, or any non-inflammable material. They can't read a book by it, but we've found out it saves a lot of bumped shells. And that, gentlemen, seems to be just about it. But I want to assure you that the principles that we've applied here are not a matter of hunch or guesswork. They're the results of experiments worked out by the Army Engineer Board. Actually, it's the Engineer Board's conviction that consideration should be made for eventual camouflage of an airdrome before it is built, that the airdrome be laid out from the very start so that the general features of its buildings and runways fit naturally into the surrounding terrain. But unfortunately, this isn't always possible. Often an airdrome at an advanced base is here today and somewhere else tomorrow. So it can't all be planned in advance. And that, gentlemen, is where you come in. When you go out to your assigned fields, you may have to start from scratch. You may find great white hangars and open terrain and runways that appear as though they can't be blended into anything. Right there is where you do a job, applying the same principles that we've applied here. Conceal and deceive are two good words to remember. Uh, just one question, Major. Just how successful is this? I mean, how effective has it been found? Well, now that's a... Gentlemen, this is where we find out. Red alert, red alert.
squadron of enemy heavy bombers approaching, 55 miles south-southwest, 20,000 feet. Red alert, yeah. red alert. I believe squadron I Squadron of enemy heavy bombers Let's approaching, go. 55 miles south-southwest, 20,000 feet. Red alert, red alert. Squadron of enemy heavy bombers approaching, 55 miles south-southwest, 20,000 feet. <laughs> Red alert, squadron of enemy heavy bombers approaching, now at 30 miles south-southwest. All batteries hold your fire, all batteries hold your fire. Red alert. Operations. Any damage? Operations. They never touched us. We didn't even know there was a raid. Major Arnold? Yes, Major. Any damage? All clear here. No damage on dispersal pens one, two, or three. Thank you. Damage and casualty report, Captain. They missed 44 squadron barracks by a mile, Major. AD, anything to report? AD number one completely destroyed, sir. They must have given us everything they had. Corporal. Yes, sir. Take a wire to the chief of operations. Right, sir. Enemy bombers attack this base. Camouflage entirely successful. Decoy airdrome completely demolished. 
Rebuilding at once. That's all. Right, sir. Well, there's your answer. Conceal and deceive. The airdrome is safe. The decoy has been destroyed. That's the purpose of it all. You win, Major. I don't win, Captain. Camouflage wins.